anyway, no, this reminds me of, you know, the first time I ever came to Horus. I think it was, uh, again, it was for uh, Jao. It was 2007. And it was, I was on a big stage in a big room, reflectors on me. And I just could not see anyone in the audience. Uh, it was pretty daunting. And you couldn't get visual feedback. You didn't know what was going on. So, uh, yeah, I think I prefer smaller rooms and smaller <laughs> crowds. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm Francesco, um, the founder and technical director of Erlang Solutions. Um, I guess, you know, being very privileged to see a programming language er called Erlang, you know, turn into an ecosystem of programming languages. I've worked with this guy on and off since 95, I think it was when I joined the computer science lab as an intern. Uh, that's when you think you know everything until you learn something new. And, uh, and then once you've learned something, you, you, you know everything until you know, Robert comes along and teaches you something new. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, 25 years on, no, 30 years on, almost. 30 yeah. years on, almost, yeah. You realize you're still learning. I've you know, called for two books, um, two rally titles. Uh, a couple times a year, I head off to Oxford University where I teach a concurrence oriented programming course. I actually finished one just last week. And yeah, I'm very much kind of a believer that, you know, it's, you know, the more languages you know and the more programming concepts you know, the better programmer you become. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm Robert Burning. Um, I was originally a physicist, but now we're going back 40 years. It's a bit further, but yeah. And then I started working for. Um, Ericsson in their computer science lab. And one of the things we were looking at eventually became Erlang. And we did more work on that. Uh, I worked in Bluetail, one of the first companies outside Ericsson to use, to use Erlang in a product. And that was in the IT boom, which was fantastic in its own way uh, until it ended and crashed. Then I worked for a while for Swedish military procurement in the modeling and simulation group. And for the last 12 years, 13 years, I've been part of Erlang Solutions, doing some consulting, but mainly training, and things like this as well. Well, you're a principal language expert, so you yeah, implement that's languages what, that's on what the they beat. say, right? That's what they say. Oh, yes. You know, and for those of you who've seen Erlang the movie, oh, hello, Robert. Hello, Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Joe, yes. <laughs> so, um, for those of you who don't know it, this is Joe Armstrong. He's the co-inventor of Erlang, uh, one of the co-inventors of Erlang. And it was Joe who actually went in and coined the term concurrency rented programming uh, during his opening keynote at the MIT Lightweight Languages Workshop in 2002. Um, so, you know, long, long time ago. At the time, no one knew what Erlang was. No one had heard of Joe Armstrong. Uh, so at least for us and for him, it was a very, very big thing. Big thing. Uh, you know, Paul Graham was, on the program, uh, was a program chair. Um, other speakers included uh, Mats, uh, Matsumoto, so the creator of Ruby. So uh, he went in and I was looking for the video a couple of weeks ago mm. and it wasn't on the MIT site. We need to reach out to them because it, it's a historical piece where I think it's one of the first times where Erlang got presented to, to the wider world. And not only did he coin and for the first time you know, mention the word concurrency oriented programming, he actually went in uh, in his talk he went in and introduced his tenants. Uh, a tenant, for those of you uh, who don't know the meaning of the word, is a belief. Uh, it's a principle or a belief. And the tenants he described was, were the following. You know, the world is concurrent. So we're all human beings in here. We're all kind of interacting concurrently with each other. So you know, there are a lot of things kind of going on concurrently in here. Um, Things in the world don't share data. So we do not share data. We do not share brains. We each have our own brain. And you know, we each store the information we want. And you know, we, we maybe go in, change it, uh, adapt it, transform it. We chuck away uh, dad jokes and, and uh, you know, uh, other, other bad jokes and, and things which aren't relevant and store the things which are relevant. And thirdly, you know, things will communicate with messages. So I'm right now asynchronously broadcasting a message to all of you, and you're each, each and every one of you storing whatever is relevant of this message in your brain. If you want to reply to me, you reply to me asynchronously, and there's nothing stopping Robert from speaking, you know, when I'm speaking. So, no, no, no. no we, and, and, and we can do it at the same time. Now we're both sending yeah. messages at the same time, too. Yeah, so. and, and we can do it concurrently, basically. And last but not least, shit happens. Things fail. Um, I, you know, I could go out and 
I don't know, catch COVID, for example, and, and be off, you know, be, be you know, in isolation for a few weeks. And, you know, despite me catching COVID and then being in isolation for a few weeks, everything else around me will still continue. And, you know, things will keep on working. Things will keep on running. Mm. So, you know, things can fail. You know, sometimes they can recover. Sometimes they won't recover. Mm. Now, based on this, these tenants, what they, what they did at a computer science lab is they went and built a programming language around this, a programming language around these beliefs. And... This, you know, this tenants is what gave Mike, Joe, and Robert uh, the main ideas of Erlang. And what are the main ideas? Well, the you know? main ideas are we were looking at telecom applications. Working at Ericsson, we're looking at how could we better program telecom applications. And then we started thinking about what's fundamental for a telecom application. What, what do we need to attack? And one thing, of course, is concurrency. There's a lot of stuff going. If you look at a telephone exchange from those days, Today as well, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. You might have th hundreds of thousands of connections, tens of thousands of calls going on, plus all the thing the switch itself is doing. All these things working concurrently. So you need to you need to ha be able to handle concurrency, massive concurrency. Uh, one another requirement of the system was it should never crash. And we were from a firm belief that things will always go wrong. You will always get errors in your system, in your code, in your data. So how can you detect errors occurring? How can you handle errors to make sure the system does not crash and keep on going? Um, another feature we had to attack was that, okay, an exchange, telephone exchange, had to be able to upgrade itself while it was running. You could not take down the exchange and upgrade, so had to, uh, upgrade it while it was running. And these were things we were looking at in the, in, when we're trying to solve this problem and thinking about how can we define, design a language and a way of doing it which handle these in the right, in a nice way. So Robert claims he was working. Uh, this is a picture from his time at the computer science laboratory. It, yeah. It looks like very, very hard work. Uh, it, it was very hard work. It was very hard work. The, the reason is we were going to an IT show. And um, that, you see a little box you see up there, that was actually a real small local exchange, which we were using, doing our testing. So we're running everything against real hardware. We thought showing that at a, at a conference is not going to attract anyone. There's no blinking lights or anything like this in it. So I thought, how can we attract people? We said, well, we'll run it. We'll run electric train and control by Alan, which we did. And this is me experimenting with the system here, building up how getting things to work. And there were magnetic sensors along the track so they, could, they would detect when a locomotive went over things like this, so you could keep track of where trains were. Um, it went slightly overboard, I will admit. I ended up writing an ATC system so you could program in where you wanted the trains to go, run two or three trains at the same time, where you wanted them to go, and it would make sure things were stopped in the right place, there were no collisions or anything like this as well for it, and it just worked. Right? But it was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, It ran for a couple of days without any, any, any problems at all. The worst thing was something we could not attack, that, that the track got dirty, for instance. And it was a completely different um, type of application for Allah. There was a lot of concurrency. And I mean, every train had its own process. Every switch had its own process. You had the ATC system, which was a number of processes all act interacting with each other. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't sell it to anyone. But uh, the idea is it was good. And yeah, it, it worked. And it was fun. And a lot of people came and looked. Uh, you know, we're talking about processes. You know, what is a process? Uh, the main building block when you're working in the Erlang ecosystem. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the word Erlang here, but we can mean Elixir, we can mean, mean uh, list flavored Erlang, we can mean, you know, there are about 35 languages running in the ecosystem today. And what brings these languages in common is the main building blocks of the programs, and they happen to be processes. So, you know, this is an example here of some Elixir code where you know, which goes in and calls, you know, the, a built-in function called spawn, which creates a process. You pass it in a module name, a function, and a list of zero more arguments. And what this does is it goes in and creates a new process, which starts executing in that function, and will continue executing in the function, either until there's no more code to execute, and we use um, recursion to keep on kind of looping, so processes inferior can never die, or until the runtime error occurs. And yeah, it takes sub-microseconds 
to, to go in and create a process. So literally, you know, microseconds, not even milliseconds, microseconds. And each process, um, each process, you know, will use a few K of memory. No, sorry, not even a few K, a few bytes of memory, at least you know, when you first created it. So it, it's a really, really lightweight, really, really powerful construct. And you know, the reason you know, they decoupled uh, the concurrency model from the underlying op operating system, I mean, that was a decision they took very, very early on. Because at the time, the underlying operating systems, you, know, you could have a maximum of, say, 16 threads. You know, think in terms of DEC or HP Workstation you know, from the late 80s. That's what you had to work with. So you had to create your own operating system on top of the operating system to get concurrency at scale back then, where you know, you, you, you'd have you know, tens of thousands of processes running in your system at any one time, where each process you know, was a phone call. And even today, you know, obviously, the virtual machines have evolved. And today, you know, we're talking about millions of processes in the virtual machine, which can happen at any, which can interact with each other at any one point in time. And you know, to have millions of processes, you can't even do that with threads. You know, they have to be lightweight. And you know, well, not every product needs you know millions of processes you know uh, interacting. Many do, and not only it's the same cost to build, say, a web server for your local flower shop, as it would be to 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 implement. Um, a web server for, for I don't know, say cars.com, yeah. for example. And big difference, it's the same cost, but the big difference is that you know, your local flower shop, the web server will scale if it needs be on, on a single machine. And, 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 and it's a pretty simple application because each request here happens to be, each web HTTP request, each request coming through mm -hmm. WebSockets happens to you know, be handled in its own process. Yeah, typically there'll be a couple of processes for it, but there can be multiple things. So how does the process work? So here we're spawning a, a the bit here, it's spawning the module foo, calling the, the function print add. And this, this is LXCA code for it, it does it, and what the print add function does, it takes two numbers, adds them together and outputs the result. That's all, the, that's all the print add function does. Very simple little function. What happens here is that a process, it runs the function it's been started with, and when that function terminates, the process dies. So this process will make one function call, it will call print add, it will put them together, write IO, put test, write out, then that process will just die and terminate. It's done its work and now it ends. So that we get back to, to the idea is we're not scared of creating pro temp processes and having them go away and things like this. We don't put it, typically don't put effort into making sure that a process does a lot of stuff and things like this for it. It's very simple. And, we, and here the process just terminates normally. It's done its job and it ends. And in terms of not being scared, what you want is you want the process for each truly concurrent activity in the system. Yeah. That's really what you want. Yeah. And, and so, you know, also when a process terminates, uh, Robert uses the word die, I use terminate. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it, it's... Um, when it terminates, all of the memory is freed straight away. So that means that the garbage collector doesn't need yeah. to tri be triggered because the memory all of a sudden all becomes available. Yeah, okay. So what happens if something goes wrong in the process? So here again, we're spawning the module foo and the function kaboom. And we're passing into arguments one and zero. So it'll be A will be one and B will be zero here. And we're dividing A by B, so we're dividing by zero. And this generates an error. Okay, this generates an error. And what happens when that, ha when that happens, that process in the error crashes. Okay, the process ends, it crashes. The difference is before the previous one had just ended normally, here it crashes and goes away and dies. Again, we're not scared of, we're not scared of uh, deleting processes and having processes die. So th these are two ways the process can end. Either it does what it's supposed to and ends, or it can crash. And usually processes will crash for two reasons. One is either your state is corrupted, is corrupt. So, you know, for example, B should never have been set to zero. So something wrong happened along the way. Or there's a bug in your code. And, you know, tell me who's ever written and they've shipped, you know, bug-free code. It, it just doesn't happen. You need to accept that there are bugs in your code. 
you can generate bugs in any system. Yes, you want. and I, I can so show 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 even how Haskell code, which compiles, is buggy. You know, it, it, it's uh, yeah. there are bugs in 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 every program, and so the, the idea behind this kind of let it crash approach is, you know, let your processes fail, but by processes failing, that means you you clear the whole state of that process because there's probably something wrong in the state which caused the runtime error, which caused the process to, to, to crash. And by clearing that state, you then let someone else deal with the problem. You let someone else deal with the error, not the programmer who caused it in the first place. If it is a programmer, that is. Yeah. And yeah, so how do processes communicate? We've, we've more or less said they're isolated from each other, which they are, they're strictly isolated. So how do they communicate? They send messages. So each process has a PID, stands for Process Identifier. And here, in, in PID 1, it, we have PID 2, which refers to this process, and we just send a message to it. And that, that the system will now send a message to that process. And then PID 1 will just keep on going. The message passing is asynchronous. We'll just keep on going. And there's a message that arrived at PID 2. That's how, that's how the processes communicate. That's the only way for them to communicate by sending messages backwards and forwards. And I think this is a very common pattern we tend to call uh, at the most once asynchronous message passing. So we send the message off, but we have no guarantees that the receiving process will receive that message because the receiving process might have terminated. Okay, so if it's, we, it's a send and pray. Yes, you, yeah. you send and pray. Now, if the process is still alive in the VM, in the, in the virtual machine, then yes, you are, that message won't be lost. You know, that message will only be lost in case the receiving process has terminated. That means you know, there's a bug. So if you need the guarantees that messages have been received, you need to have you know, the receiving process acknowledge that message. And it does so with an asynchronous call. And if you don't receive an acknowledged message, well, you put in your business logic of your program, you decide what to do. So you could you know, send a new message to someone else and wait for a reply. And if you don't get a reply, you, you continue until you get an acknowledgement. And we go from at the most once to at an at least once strategy, which is, which is again, very, very common. And then there's a third strategy, which is at the most once with notification. I send off a message to Robert, and Robert maybe receives it and responds, great, I know the request was successful. Or if I then time out, I don't know what state Robert's in. No. And you know, we'll get back to that particular example a little bit later. Because you know, Robert could be super busy, so the message is queued and he'll eventually get to it. Or he might have crashed or gone on vacation. And, uh, and so, yeah, and, uh, so, yeah, we don't know. So, you know, assuming you're transferring money from get bank account A to bank account B, you need to know if Robert's executed that code or not. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, this is, yeah, this is so, 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 yeah. So, messages, when, so when I send a message to Robert, what he does, what he does is he takes that message and puts it in, in something called a mailbox. Each process has its own mailbox. And whenever the process which owns a mailbox enters a receive clause. So there's a receive clause which goes in and scans the messages sequentially. And, there, and what it allows you to do is to selectively pick what messages you want to read. So this is an incredibly powerful construct because again, it reduces the complexity of your code. You go in, you send a message. So assume you know, you, it's not payday yet you receive lots of posts, what you want to do is you want to only pick up you know, the birthday cards and letters from your grandmother. You don't want to touch the bills. You just let the bills pile up in, in your mailbox and you pick up all the other posts and magazines and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, payday comes. And at that point, okay, let's pay the bills. You pick up all the bills, you take them out and, and you clear them. And this is, this is you know, what makes, for example, you know, processes, uh, which you use for finite state machines, incredibly powerful because it simplifies the whole code. Any, any events which come out of sequence are just left in the mailbox and then handled when you're in a state where you can actually handle them. 
instead of having to handle them and having a case for messages coming out of sequence, which just yeah, really increments and you know, makes your complexity explode. Yeah. When you start thinking about your, your look at the systems, you'll find there's an awful lot of messages, type, different type of messages being sent between processes. And if I had to handle every message everywhere, every time, that would completely drown out the whole system. And this allows me to restrict that in a very nice way. Yeah. So failure detection itself is the reason which actually got Erlang to be concurrent. So you need to, you know, if, how do you detect failure? Well, you need something to detect that something else has failed. So you need at least two processes where one process monitors the other process. And I think, you know, th this reminds me of a story with Mike Williams, so one of the three co-inventors of Erlang. In his early days, he was working on mobile telephony systems when your know, mobile telephony systems could only call other mobile telephony systems. And what was the error handling they had in place? Well, they had a human being sitting in front of a screen, looking at that screen 24-7. And as soon as this human being saw lots of text kind of scrolling by, they knew the system had crashed. And so they go in and manually restart it. And conceptually, you know, it works in a similar way. The only thing is that they've replaced this human being with another process. And so processes go in and monitor each other by calling, by, by linking to each other. And what this does, it creates a bidirectional link between these two processes. And if a process which is linked to each other crashes, yeah. yeah it's an, ex an exit signal is sent. But the system says, oh, I'm linked to this process. It sends an exit signal to that process. In this case, we've PID1 crashes, an exit system sends an exit signal to PID2. It's something I don't have to explicitly do myself, just the very fact that I'm linked to that process means the system does that. And when that exit signal from the crash arrives at PID2, it crashes PID2. Right. Yeah. yeah, it crashes. That does not, is not as bad as it sounds, right? Because this allows you to set up a system where I have a bunch of uh, cooperating processes working together, and if one crashes, I'll take the whole lot down, which is often a very good way of doing it. However, that how am I going to monitor stuff? Right? That's, that's where we get into yeah. work. I mean, imagine you've got two processes, each handling the receiver of a phone call and the initiator of a phone call. And if one of these two processes terminates, you want the other process to terminate because yeah, you've lost one of the two parties on the call. You want to clean up after yourself. You don't want to have lots of dangling processes. So you know, the two will be linked to each other. And, you know, and, and yeah, you solve that problem. So that's when you would go link. But you actually have the ability to do what we call to trap exits. So by calling process you know, flag you know, tr and sending the trap exit flag to true, if a, if a process terminates abnormally, it sends an exit signal to PID2. But this PID2 having, you know, trapping exits will convert that exit signal to a message and place it in the process mailbox. And there, these exit signals can then be received in the receive clause like any other message. So what this allows you to do is to say, oh, PID1 has terminated. Let's clean up after it. So if it's, for example, if we knew that PID1 was in the middle of a bank transaction transferring money from account A to account B, when you know, PID2 receives the exit signal, oh, something's gone wrong here. Let's check. You know, has the money been taken away, has the money been debited from account 1A? Yes, it has. Okay. Has it been credited to account B? No, it hasn't. Okay. At this point, we can decide to either, you know, um, you know credit the money or refund process A. And, and again, that's, you know, that's based on the business logic. So this is what we would be doing in this case. So we're saying, you know, when we're saying you know, let processes crash, don't do defensive programming. What we're saying is, you know, don't ignore the errors. Just handle these errors in a slightly different way, and let someone else handle these errors in a generic way. Mm -hmm. And and that's where you know, programmers avoid defensive programming. I mean, programmers when they go in and put defensive programming, you know, snippets in their code, they end up inserting even more bugs than what they they're able to address. Because if you knew what was causing your process to crash or was causing the bugs, they wouldn't be there in the first place. So you, you can't really, 
defend yourselves against the unknown. And yeah, this is just saying that, well, if you have a set of linked processes and one crashes, it sends an exit signal to the ones it's linked to, and they'll crash and send, so you get, you'll propagate the exit signal to the whole set of processes linked together. This is just saying that if PID2 here is trapping exits, when it gets the exit signal from PID1, it won't propagate it because it's not crashing itself. It's, hand, it's catching that error, knowing, knows what to do with the error, cleaning up or whatever it might be. We're ignoring it. Maybe it's just something we don't care if it dies. Yeah. But it will not send it on by default to PID3. Think about your Matic Java. How do you know if Java thread is terminated or even a Go routine? If a Go routine you know, crashes, you have no idea it's crashed. Here, we find out immediately other than you know polling and you know and, and building things on top yeah. of it here we find out immediately and we can react immediately to it so a phone call is dropped tunk, let's set it up again very very quickly yeah. you know maybe even before you know, the line drops and you know what we've often seen happen is a lot of programming languages bolting on concurrency uh, but and adding concurrency even to modern programming languages but what we've rarely seen are these error propagate these asynchronous error propagation uh, uh, channels, which allow you to detect failure. So, you know, it, it's 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 something which yeah. we've even tried to explain often to language inventors. But if you're not setting out to solve a problem of a system, you know, which never fails or fault tolerant systems, it's not something you know you realize you need until you know someone goes in and and and, and hits a wall. It does mean you have to think a lot when you're designing the architecture of your system. You have to think a lot about saying, which, okay, this group of processes, this type of process, they crash. What am I supposed to do with them? Ignore them, maybe, or monitor them and clean up after them, or maybe I should restart them because you'll have some processes in the system which are so fundamental, or well, what they're doing is so fundamental to the system that if they go away, I can't say the system's working. They might be providing fundamental services for it. And I can use the links and the exit signals and the trapping to monitor those. And what we, what we will then do here is we have processes we call supervisors. They're just normal processes, but their job is to monitor other processes. So this process supervisor here monitors these three processes. And if one of those dies, it knows what to do. Maybe it should restart that process so it can continue providing the service. Maybe it should kill them all because they're all working together and restart them all. Terminate them. I kill process. <laughs> I'm not going to go into more of that. Yes. <laughs> or do, do other things as well too for it. But yeah. But so, so that's another thing that might be necessary. It's a system detect. Yeah, this, this service is providing is so fundamental, I have to make sure it keeps going. And the processes die because something goes wrong, but I will restart them. And I'll typically have a process we call a supervisor do the work that does that. That's its job. And if I want to be slightly... Yeah, sarcastic here, we can say in this type of system, it's all, it's, it's the workers that do all the work, right? The supervisors don't do any work. Best case, they restart something. But, uh, but, yeah, yeah. With, with exception of links, I think none of what we're talking about no. is, is, uh, is no. new. Um, you know, think of small talk. In small talk, you've got objects. Uh, objects do not share memory, and they communicate with each other through message passing. Uh, and yeah, by the way, I mean this is a quote from Alan Kay, um, and you know it, it's uh, and, and Alan Kay is the person who coined the term, uh, re referring to this as object-oriented programming. Um, and yeah, it, it's uh, it actually, you know, actually got Joe Armstrong, the co-inventor of Erlang, here in, in Aarhus. I think it was. 2004, 2005, when he first came yeah. and spoke at Jao, to going to claim, well, you know, actually, in fact, so, you know, it, 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 with tongue in cheek, uh, uh, pointing out that, well, you know, Erlang might be the only object oriented language being used out there, you know, because it's based on message passing, you've got isolation between objects and you've got polymorphism. And he said that, you know, with a bit of tongue in cheek because not everyone agreed. But, <laughs> you know, to, to, to quote Alan Kay, I mean, this whole thing with inheritance. Is something which you know came after uh, OO was invented. It, it wasn't there in the first place. I can just make one one extra comment on crashing processes. Because we crash processes, that means they have to be isolated. Because they they were sharing data, and one of the processes sharing data crashed, it might ruin the data for the other process. So they are totally isolated. So we can quite happily crash a process and it won't ruin anything for anyone else. 
again, all these things fit together once you start fiddling with and thinking about them. So yeah. they started working with you know, Erlang. You know, the first products they started using Erlang for came in 92. They were shipped in 94. And they started using it at Ericsson on a large scale in 95, 96. So why does all of this matter today, I think 30 years on after you started your work? You know, wh wh why is it so important? You know, if you think of today's systems, they'll all be distributed by nature. Um, think of mobile. You know, you've got your mobile apps, you've got, you know, connecting to serverless infrastructure, connecting to content management systems, connecting to, 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 you know, to cloud, edge, and you've got IoT systems, devices. Any system today connected to the internet has to be both scalable and reliable. And, you know, concurrency based on no shared memory is the key uh, to distribution of these services and microservices for that matter. So, you know, what you end up doing is you distribute your state for scale and you copy it for resilience. And, and to do this efficiently, you need a programming model which can handle this out of the box. And it, it's the concurrency model here is a concurrency model based on no shared memory and message passing, which gives you both. So basically, if you've got a no shared memory concurrency model, you get distribution by default because you've got two processes and it doesn't matter, these processes don't share memory, so it doesn't matter where you locate these two processes. Mm. It could be the same program, but could, they could be running on separate machines, right? So you get distribution. As soon as you've got a program which can run on separate machines, you've got scalability because you can scale not only vertically, but also horizontally. Mm. And you've got reliability because if you happen to lose a machine and you've got a copy of the data on another machine, the other machine can kick in and take over. So they're all kind of connected to each other. Not only add multi-core to, 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 the, to the game and distribution together give you parallelism. So not only can you scale horizontally, but you can also now scale vertically because two processes can easily be placed on two separate cores and run independently of each other. And obviously you know, it becomes more expensive if you've got two processes running on the same core Message passing is very cheap. They're running two different cores on the same chip, chip set. It becomes a bit more expensive. Uh, on, on two separate chips on the same computer, a bit more expensive. And you know, two chipsets on two separate computers, even more expensive. But the programming model, the, the whole logic behind it, is exactly the same. And it took me a while to realize, but I managed to get, in 2018, uh, Carl Hewitt, so the creator of the actor model, uh, Tony Hoare, who created new concurrent sequential processes, and Joe Armstrong, who created um, Erlang style concurrency, co-created Erlang style concurrency, together on the same, in the same room, uh, same sofa, for a panel discussion. And th these were the people who drove you know, forward kind of the research around concurrency. And the question I asked them was, what problem were you trying to solve? That was the first opening question I asked them all. And Carl Hewitt, who created the actor model, replied, oh, I was trying to figure out how to program distributed systems. That was the research problem he was trying to solve. Tony Hoare, uh, who created you know, concurrent sequential processes, oh, I was trying to figure out how to program transputers. So the predecessor of multi-core architectures. And Joe Armstrong replied, oh, I was trying to figure out how to implement fault tolerant systems. So no one said scalability, but again, it, it, it's you know, scalability is one of the side effects yeah. we got. But the three people coming up independently of each other with very, very similar solutions, all solving what appears to be different problems, but in fact, boil down and are very, very similar in nature yeah. and very much connected to each other. Yeah. So it kind of really, really kind of those answers blew me away because I, I had never made that connection. Well, we were all, all the three, very problem oriented. We were out to solve. We had a problem. We we're out to solve a solve the problem, and that's what that's what we were doing. That's why we. That's why it ended up looking like it does because we thought that this was a good absolute way of solving the problem. And that's the same with the other was Carl Hewitt and. Um, Tony Hoare as well, too. How do I solve the problem? What do I need to do to solve the problem? And that was it. Very problem-oriented. And whilst 
uh, Tony Hoare and Carl Hewitt knew of each, other, uh, each other's research and, you know, yeah. and, and they cooperated. Uh, we, had not, we, we didn't know the actor model yeah. when we were doing this. We did not know the actor model. We found out later when people wrote, wrote um, articles about Alang saying it implemented the actor model. Then we'd go out and find the actor model and find, yes, it did. And I met Carl Hewitt a few years, well, four years ago mm. about this, and I mentioned this to him, and I was a bit sort of um, embarrassed because we had to know about the actor model. And he said, no, that's very good because the actor model had come at a more theoretical point of view. and We'd arrived at a very pragmatic point of view. He thought that, the, that these two were so close together showed the strength of the actor model itself. It just goes to show, you know, good inventions get invented at least once. Yeah. At least once. And in this case, yeah, it was three times. Yeah. You can find this panel on YouTube. Just search on um, the hashtag talk concurrency and, uh, and, and you, you'll, you'll be able to find it there. Yeah. So this is, yes, we, we tend to separate concurrency and parallelism. They're not, from our point of view, they're not the same thing. Concurrency... That's, that's a property of the problem you're trying to solve and your solution. Like if I'm doing a web server, I want to have lots of connections running, on the, running concurrently in the same system. Whereas we view parallelism, that's a property of the underlying system you're running on. So I might write my concurrent web server that can handle 100,000 connections on something only running on 10 cores. Parallelism's in the 10 cores at the bottom, concurrencies in, in the problem and in my solution to the problem. And that way they, they're not directly connected to each other. Which also means when I'm designing my thing for my concurrent problem, I don't really have to think about at that time what the parallelism of the underlying system is. I don't have to, I very, 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 very seldom have to retarget my system knowing on how much, for example, how many cores I'm running on. The system just does it for me. It load balances and spread things out. I just don't have to think about it. It does that for me. And I think the best example you know, we have, concurrency, you know, think you know, four of your friends go to a pizzeria, yeah. the pizza baker, you order four pizzas, the pizza baker starts doing all four pizzas at the same time. So you know, flatten the dough on all four pizzas and he'll put the sauce on all four pizzas. He will um, yeah, put the cheese on, put the toppings on, and then you put in the pizzas in the oven one at a time. He's doing them concurrently. He's, he's doing, doing the concurrently. pizzas concurrently. So he's basically uh, dealing with four pizzas at the same time. Parallelism is when you get one cook or one pizza baker, and he'd go in, he'd do one pizza, put it in the oven. He'd do another pizza, put it in the oven. The referred pizza, put it in the oven. A fourth pizza, and put it in the oven. So he'll be much faster doing one pizza, probably four times faster than you know, the baker doing four pizzas, but he, he, he does them sequentially. Yeah. He does one pizza at a time, and that's parallelism. And how do you scale parallelism? Well. You throw more cores, cores at the problem. You so you end up having four pizza bakers, uh, each doing a pizza. And then you, know, you end up putting four pizzas in the oven at the same time, and you get your pizzas much, much faster. But all of a sudden, you need four bakers instead of just one. That's a very good example and of the difference between concurrency as we see it and parallelism as we see it. So comparing, you know, the Beam, which is the prevalent Erlang virtual machine to the JVM. So I was at the computer science lab uh, doing my internship when you know, Java came out. And you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Klaus Wiekström, came up to me and actually put the Java white paper on my, on my desk. And I started reading it and I actually got a sense of deja vu. Uh, it was a concurrency model. You know, at the time, you know, the JVM had green threads. Um, I don't know why they got removed, but... Uh, you know, I guess it was focused on the problems you were trying to solve. They had a garbage collector, which was very novel at the time. Uh, it had you know, built-in memory management, all running on a virtual machine. And you know, there are lots of talks out there. You're know, comparing the JVM to the Beam. You know, go in and Google them. But you know, I'll just point out there are three main differences. The first is threads on the JVM versus concurrency. That, that's the first main difference. Uh, we've got shared memory versus no shared memory. On the JVM, threads can share memory. In Erlang, processes can't. And the third is mutable state versus immutable state. So when you've got shared memory, multiple threads can go in and mutate the state of the memory. In Erlang, only the process which owns the memory can go in and mutate it. So it's, and, and 
a concurrency model based on a shared memory means by default the stop the world garbage collector. A and it's also much harder to go in and use your code base for distributed programming uh, because of the location of your shared memory. That becomes a sticking point. So you can still do distributed programming with Java, but you need to use a model similar to the one we've got in Erlang where you know, threads don't share memory and that, that work, that will work. And what we tend to say is, I mean, the JVM and the Beam were built for completely different purposes. Yeah, yeah. They, they were both. They both had a specific target type of problem they were both trying to solve. The G, JVM had one. The Beam had one. They were just different. Well, they are just different. That's why they're looking differently for it. And in that sense, both are right because they're both doing their thing, but they're just doing different things. So n not one solution is right and the other's wrong. They're both right. For both wrong, if you want to see it like that, but they're both right for doing it like that. And again, you'll find that in other virtual machines, other languages as well. They're targeted doing something specifically. So, so I usually say, you know, the JVM was built for speed and parallelism, yeah. whilst the Beam was built for scalability and for resilience. Mm -hmm. So it will not be the fastest as long as it's fast enough. Mm -hmm. Then, then it's good. But not only the Beam has parallelism in it. You start running the Erlang virtual machine on a multi-core architecture, it will start a, core, a thread for every core. But the big difference here is that the parallelism has been removed from the hands of the programmer. You just program Erlang the way you, you usually would, and then your program, you know, assuming there are no bottlenecks in it, will then go in and scale automatically on multi-core architectures. And you know, at least in, in my world, you know. Uh, the, 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 the power of concurrency to J JVM got added by a friend of ours, Jonas Bonaire, who got the concurrency model through ACA. And he got the ideas from Erlang and tried to implement them as best as he could on the JVM. And he often, you know, Computer Sweden used to publish, probably still do, a, a list of the top 10 programmers in Sweden, mm -hmm. top 20 programmers in Sweden. And Jonas has always made the first... <laughs> You know, uh, being you know one the number one programmer, quite quite a few hours. My, my text to him was yeah, something to tell your grandchildren, and and it's because it's not easy to do what he tried to achieve. You know, trying to get the concurrency model on the onto the JVM, the Erlang concurrency model onto the JVM, for the simple reason that the JVM was not built for it. And there are things which he still hasn't been able to solve. But, but I can say he was he's always been very open about he's not. Doing about this is what he's doing. Yes, he's taking ideas from Alan and the OTP system above it, but he's been very open about that. So he hasn't been sort of sneaking it past or things like this sort of well. And we did invite him to come speak at this conference. He couldn't make it, but he'll be doing uh, go to in yeah. uh, Copenhagen. But bottom line is, you know, the, the, the JVM and the Beam are different. They were built to, you know, to solve very, very different problems. Yeah, this one, right? This is concurrency. This is concurrency. So one big user so, of Erlang in the back end. Don't look at the title. This is how bad Erlang devs are at marketing. You need to look in the text. This, this, is, this is the original WhatsApp back end servers uh, written in Erlang before they went into, into Facebook. They were running, they were running, well, they had a number of these, but on one, on one machine running FreeBSD, they were running one Erlang node on it, which, were, which had one million TCP connections up and running at the same time. Two million. Well, that, that was next year. That was that, one so million. So the one million was 2011. Yeah, 2000, two, two, 2012, there were two million TCP connections on one machine, on one Erlang node, at least one or two processes per connection. Now, for me, running a two or three million Erlang process is trivial. How do you get two million TCP connections into one machine? That's a difficult bit, but that's what they were doing. And they, we talked to them occasionally, and we found out sometimes they're actually running three million TCP connections in one system, on one Erlang system. And this is just to show that Erlang can, could then, and still can, even better now, handle a lot of processes if that is what you need. So that's what you're after. And the best part is, you know, they were able to hit two to three million with both CPU capacity and memory to spare, and they were able. It's not that they reached a peak of three million; they were able to, you know, reach between two to three million in a sustainable way. That's what the servers worked on. They they were out yeah. to set to reduce uh, their hardware footprint um, and the server footprint, and overall uh, reduce you know the complexity of their infrastructure. So um, yeah, and, and we see that you know when they got acquired, 
in 2014, I think it was, they were, you know, they had half a billion users. They were adding a million users a day at that point. And the server side team consisted of nine developers who took care of all development, all uh, maintenance of the existing code base, and all of support. They were the ones, this team of nine developers, including um, one of the founders, they were the ones who got woken up in the middle of the night when something went wrong. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you do it? Well, have as simple as possible of an infrastructure and, you know, and as, as little as possible of an infrastructure. Because the more computers you add, the more complexity you add, the more likely things are, are to fail. Mm-hmm. But the changes WhatsApp did back in 2011 made it mainstream. They made it mainstream into FreeBSD and, and I think most of the other operating systems. Yeah as well as the Beam Virtual Machine. So in 2015, on a large instance on, on Amazon, um, they were able to get an instance of Phoenix running. For those of you who don't know what Phoenix is, it's going to be the next Ruby on Rails. It's a, uh, it's a um, app for kind of APIs and web development, mm. which you know, has kind of a lot of features. But it also has you know, the scalability of the Erlang virtual machine, of the Beam. And it has those features. You know, it, it runs on Erlang. It runs on Elixir. And they were able to achieve 2 million TCP IP connections on a large instance on Amazon with lots of memory. And again, do so sustainably. And what got them you know, to stop? Again, they did so with memory and CPU capacity to spare. What stopped them from scaling beyond 2 million was a uh, throttling of the network. I don't think you know, Amazon ever thought that anyone would want to have 2 million TCP IP connections on a single machine. You know, it, it wasn't really doable with most of the technology, so they started throttling yeah. and, and stopping them. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, and this is the blog post, again, which uh, at that point turned Elixir into a first-class citizen of the beam. So Elixir, uh, it's a new programming language with a Ruby-like syntax, which is part of the Erlang ecosystem. And it, it was in the conjunction with that blog when Elixir became a first-class citizen that we realized Erlang was no longer a programming language. It was an ecosystem of languages which had evolved, just like .NET or the JVM. You know, JVM, you know, uh, mm. Scala, Clojure, Groovy, uh, you name it. And the same, the same with .NET, with F Sharp. C Sharp, Visual Basic, and others. And these languages running on top all have access to the same basic properties that Erlang have for having massive concurrency, doing the fault tol- building fault tolerance systems, and all these type of things. They all have access to the same thing because they're running on top of the Erlang and the Beam Virtual Machine together. They have all have access to these. And they can interface each other as well, too, if you want to. And you know, with, you know, the, 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 well, with, um, um, Processors becoming more and more powerful on devices, you know, we're going to see the beam running on devices, you know, more. You know, we're going to see that become more and more common, and at that point, your security becomes critical, and that's when your know, languages, statically typed languages, uh, yeah. you know, will be needed uh, to to kind of make sure that uh, these systems, these devices, are secure, and that's when your know, language such as Alpaca, Gleam, Fez. Uh, will all be making an impact. One of them is going to win, but they're all statically typed languages. Erlang and Elixir are all dynamically typed. So, you know, you get a lot of flexibility, but it becomes a bit more dangerous because, you know, there might be serious security. I think they're going to start waving their hands. Yes. (laughs) We're almost there. We're almost almost there. there, Yeah. But Elixir today, I think, is larger, much larger than Erlang. And my prediction is it will probably become 10 times larger than Erlang. And why is that? Uh, Well, again, going back... You, you know, I always ask language inventors what problem were we trying to solve, and the problem Jose Valin was trying to solve when he created Elixir was to bring the power of Erlang to new programming communities. And he started off with the web, and started falling off by embedded, and is now working on machine learning. Yeah, he, he was looking at well, he's, he was a Ruby on Rails developer, and he said, well, what's Ruby on Rails missing? It's, oh, Erlang's got a lot of stuff that's very interesting there, but what's Erlang missing? Well, I'll take stuff with me from the Ruby on Rails environment, put that on, and that's what became Elixir. And, and it wasn't so much that he didn't like what he saw. What he didn't like was what he didn't see. 
yeah. and that's what he added. And he added, and, and these were tools and uh, items which were needed, uh, you know, for other programming language communities to solve different types of problems which we weren't solving. You know, we weren't trying to solve the problems oh, of the we web. Have to flip now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. very much, you know, focus has been not on solving problems but on the adoption of a solid runtime and language principles with good, you know, frameworks and availability. Yeah. So, you know, I'll skip this, but, you know... Yeah, that, that's, that's me. It's a rip-off of a, a Greenspan's 10th rule. He was talking about this, but I'm talking about here. That th what the basis of this is, yes, it's a joke, but I think from the same side as his, he was talking about Lisp, is that putting these, trying to put these things afterwards just doesn't work in the long run. These ideas, in our case, the concurrency, the message passing, the error handling... Uh, code upgrading has to be built, baked in from the very beginning. You can't com come with them afterwards, otherwise you, you will get a, a, a bug-ridden, bug slow implementation of it, because it just doesn't work. They all, all these things start interacting with each other. You fiddle with one, you'll, you'll affect the other. You have to get them in from the very beginning. Really. You can do it, but it will not work as properly. And yeah, the point here is twofold. One is you can't bolt on concurrency to a language as an afterthought. It, it's something you need to build in from day one else, you know, you, you'll run into trouble. The second is, you know, I really encourage you to go out and start thinking concurrently. Learn Erlang, learn Elixir, uh, because it will change the way you think and reason pro around programming. You might not end up using it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it will make you a much, much better programmer, regardless of the programming languages you use, because the principles and, and the ideas are those you need uh, to program in modern settings and modern environments. But it will require rethink. Yeah. Just accept that. It will require everything yeah. because it affects what you, how you work with stuff. All right. Yeah. Okay. Are we on time? Thank you. Yeah. Let's yeah. I'm Italian. <laughs> Big hand of applause. Thank you. <laughs>